Ten years. Ten years of struggling for the people of Flint through one of the biggest government-created crises this country has ever seen. And it all started with the decision to switch the city's water source to the Flint River. I think it's an emergency. Lead is an emergency. After many cuts to save money, the pipes were not treated correctly, which corroded them and leached lead into the city's water source, poisoning the city. The state of Michigan stayed in denial about the safety of the water, all while the people suffered the consequences. After many investigations, the truth came to the surface and they were found responsible. We have a short-term water crisis that needs to be repaired. The spotlight on the city just kept shrinking. And 10 years later, the Flint people are still dealing with the lasting effects of the crisis. We as a nation, we forget things as soon as they happen. But also from the lack of action taken by the government. I really did need a glass of water. This is not a stunt. Despite the hardships, the Flint people have risen up showing love, leadership, passion, and most importantly, resilience. April 25th, 2014, is a day that would forever have a hold on Flint, even 10 years later. Pain, outrage, and injustice rippled through the Flint community at the flip of a switch. The controversial decision to switch the city's water source to the Flint River still haunts the city to this very day. The people have been pushed to the edge but have not been afraid to fight back. As we revisit the mistrust, discovery, advocacy, poverty, and the lasting effects, Flint has shown its resilience through it all. No apology could make up for the damage the Flint people had no choice but to endure. Cooper Austin breaks down the injustice. I just feel like if you do wrong, then you should pay the price. That ruined a lot of people's lives. Even mine, <laughs> really. After years of the people of Flint having a lead-filled water supply, the government finally started taking some kind of accountability. I am sorry, and I will fix it. No citizen of this great state should endure this kind of catastrophe. Government failed you, federal, state, and local leaders. Governor Rick Snyder made apologies, but the problems were just too big for a quick fix. After a decade of investigation, congressional hearings, courtroom testimony, civil suits all point to the state being liable for the start of the crisis, nobody has paid the price. The criminal investigations were like a never-ending roller coaster and were a huge disappointment for the people of Flint. Michigan's former Attorney General Bill Schuette's charges included 15 people, two companies, but no governor. Several of the charges included misconduct in office, conspiracy, and for some, involuntary manslaughter. And with these charges came promises he could not keep. We will proceed to deliver justice and hold those accountable who broke the law. These charges were a big step for justice in Flint, but they had one glaring omission. Governor Rick Snyder was charged with nothing. The new Attorney General Dana Nessel came in after Schutte's term ended. In June of 2019, out of nowhere, Nestle and the prosecution team dropped all of the charges brought forth by Schutte. This led to even more theory in Flint, as people thought the government had betrayed them once again. Nestle appointed a prosecution team that included attorneys Kim Worthy and Fadwa Hamoud to run the Flint water investigation. And with a new prosecution team, came not so new promises. But we will get it done. We will make the right and just decision at the end of our investigation. It took a year and a half for Nestle's team to bring new charges, which she finally did in January of 2021. Some of these charges included misconduct in office, willful neglect of duty, and once again, involuntary manslaughter. And this time, former Governor Snyder was added to the list of defendants. Two and a half years, many court appearances and appeals later, there were no trials and still no answers from the Attorney General. The water you drink is toxic. Every aspect of your life will be impacted by whether or not you vote. That perfectly transitions into the um, Flint water crisis. Do we have any updates on the investigation? Not at this time, no. Really? All right, so it's been 10 years. Do you think justice is going to be... Uh, all right. In the end, 
The prosecution failed due to the decision to use a one-man grand jury. That backfired on them when the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that the use of a one-man grand jury was unconstitutional. Finally, on November 1st of 2023, all of the charges were officially dropped. The prosecution described the decision as putting the final nail in the coffin for the Flint water prosecutions. These cases are not not going forward because the evidence isn't there. It doesn't mean that the defendants are not guilty. It means that no one will ever hear and no decision will be ever be made because this evidence is being denied from being heard. After the years of suffering the Flint people have had to go through, they are noticing the pure lack of justice. Nothing has changed, but it's a symptom of a worse problem. We have polluted the earth, the water, the air, and that's the way it is. Well, there was a time when we thought it, you know, we was going to see something uh, good happening for us, you know, but then it comes that nothing's going to happen, you know. It has been 10 years since the start of the Flint water crisis. Since then, there have been two attorney generals, two sets of charges, thousands of lead poisoned children, at least 12 deaths because of the water, and yet still, zero justice for the people of Flint. Although nobody has been found criminally responsible for the crisis, there have been several civil suits, including one settled back in 2021. That involves over $600 million that was ruled to go back towards the Flint people. Years after the settlement, nobody has seen a dime of it. Over 10,000 lead pipes have been replaced in the city of Flint. They may pay high prices for the water, but many choose not to use their own tap. After years of broken trust and unfulfilled promises from the government, people line up for water like how they did at the start of it all. Shane Harris has the story on the broken trust then and the broken trust now. I wouldn't trust it at all. In June of 2019, more than five years after the start of the Flint water crisis, the Environmental Protection Agency officially said Flint's water was okay to drink. Testing results finally showed that lead levels were considered normal. But many people of Flint just don't trust the water is safe and may never trust it again. There are several reasons for that. I avoid using phrasing of it's safe to drink, right? You kind of lean more towards it's, it meets regulations. So, but here, you know, when you're already talking to a community that's so scared of their water, that's not comforting. <laughs> that's not, does not placate anyone. Danielle Land, a pediatric public health research associate at Michigan State University, along with other top pediatricians, all think the same about lead exposure. There is no safe level of lead exposure. The CDC put that wording out in 2012, and it's true. The EPA says the legal limit of lead in water of homes is currently set at 15 parts per billion for action, but will soon go down to 10. Levels in parts of Flint were so bad they were considered toxic waste in 2016, testing over 20,000 parts per billion. Um, that action level, realistically, I think four or five parts per billion would be more of a health-based standard. Either way, we need to set a health-based water standard. Hearing this, many people may wonder why their water isn't at zero parts per billion. What most don't know is that before the 80s, lead was used in almost everything, from the paint on their walls to the lead-coated pipes. That is the reason we cannot achieve an absolute zero level of lead. There's the action level of 15 parts per billion, right? The maximum contaminant goal level, which is more health-based, is zero. The EPA says it's zero. Realistically, we cannot achieve zero. The government lied to the people of Flint about the water being safe. Families had to find out for themselves, and the government tried to cover it up. They were then told that no level of lead is safe. Kids were poisoned. Were community members supposed to just go on with their lives? The Flint water crisis has caused people's trust for their government to completely disappear. You know, once you lose trust, that is one of the hardest things to gain back. The deadline has come and gone, and the water pipes throughout the city of Flint still not have been finished being replaced. The city is only responsible for replacing service lines on the street, not the lines in homes, and very few homeowners can afford to replace their pipes. The fact is, a lot of the Flint community does not trust their water, or their government. The question now is how does the government get that trust back? So I would say for me to trust the water again, I would literally have to see a process of the pipes getting dug out and fixed and put back. And until then, I'm probably not going to trust the water ever again. As of March 13th, 2024, the city of Flint has been held in contempt for not meeting a court order deadline of pipe replacement. How do you know? I don't trust them. They lied to us once. Will they lie to us again?
with absolutely no justice in the Flint people's trust torn apart. It's hard to see a light through this crisis. However, there are always people who help by bringing back a spark into the Flint community, and Dr. Mona is one of them. She is just one of the many who have worked tirelessly to help heal Flint by making groundbreaking discoveries, speaking the truth when no one else could, and creating social programs that help protect the future of the people of Flint. Kimi Abinaj highlights the good that has come from this all. There wasn't just the light exposure, but it was just this injustice that happened to our children, this betrayal, this loss of trust, um, this worry, this anxiety, this guilt, this fear, all of that was part of the water crisis. Flint pediatrician Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha was thrust into the middle of the Flint water crisis when she held her own press conference in the fall of 2015. While the state was denying any concerns that the community members had about their water, she discovered high levels of lead in children's blood. Realizing the dangers of lead poisoning in kids, Dr. Mona went the extra mile to get this information out quickly and along the way became the voice of Flint's children. You know, I found this research and then I publicly shared this research, um, which is not like how doctors and scientists are supposed to share research. Yeah. We're supposed to um, publish them and present it at conferences, but that takes time to go through that peer review process. But, you know, every minute that went by was a minute that another kid was drinking this water. Shortly after Dr. Mona released this information to the public, it opened the national floodgates. The press got involved and it was even harder for the government to now deny this information. And the people began to become more and more aware of this issue. There was like a, almost a sigh of relief. Like we knew something was wrong. We didn't know exactly what it was. Thank you for putting words to the why. Thank you for kind of legitimizing our concerns. This was only the beginning for Dr. Mona. As her face became a recognized leader during the Flint water crisis, she used her publicity and amazing community to come together and create special programs and help turn such a negative into a positive. Sometimes it doesn't present right away. Sometimes we don't see the consequences of those bad things right away. And we really need to kind of follow children over time because sometimes those bad things present later on in life. And that's where the Flint Registry comes into play. The registry is for anyone who has been exposed to lead in Flint's water. This is a free resource used to help those affected. The main goal of the registry is to reach and learn about as many people as possible and how the water has impacted their health by using programs such as lead eliminations, healthcare, child development, and nutrition. And that effort is to, to see how folks are doing and more importantly get them supported to, re, in, to many resources to improve their health and development. Uh, we've been able to enroll about 20,000 people in the Flint Registry, which is amazing. Um, and then we've made about 30,000 referrals to really important things like literacy programs and early childhood and trauma-informed care and healthcare, all these great things. And the big data from the registry is telling us a lot. Besides the registry, Dr. Mona has implemented several other groundbreaking, lasting programs as well. Nutrition Prescription is one of the ones that she has started to make sure kids are getting their proper nutrients. They can take the said prescription to the Flint Farmer's Market and get a certain amount of free fruits and veggies. Another program is called RX Kids. This grants all expecting mothers in the community an amount of money along with an allowance per child a month to guarantee better care and lessen the poverty rates. We have built this model of hope and recovery, not just for Flint kids, but we have made an impact across the nation. Anger, anxiety, frustration. There have been a lot of emotions to handle for Flint families as the crisis laid out an uncertain future for them. Through hardships and health struggles, one Flint family has become the definition of resilience. This is the story of one of the biggest fighters for the Flint community, Melissa Mays, who continues to seek a better and brighter future for not only her and her family, but for everyone who is a part of the same struggle. I was terrified because I had no idea what had just happened to my son's futures. <laughs> Melissa Mays and her three sons had their world flipped upside down back in 2015 when they received a letter in the mail. I opened it up and there was a tiny little, a uh, bunch of tiny print through this whole sheet and it said for the previous nine months, so the entire time we had switched to the Flint River, um, our water had been contaminated with cancer causing disinfection byproducts. The switch to the Flint River also exposed the family to high levels of lead. When consuming lead, it can cause many issues such as memory and hair loss, breathing troubles, weakened bones, and so much more. 
At the time of the exposure, Caleb was 15, Christian was 10, and Cole, the youngest, was nine. The Mays family noticed the effects right away. Christian fell off his bike um, a few months prior and his wrist shattered, his bones like collapsed and they couldn't understand why he's a healthy kid. Cole had pneumonia in September of 2014, which now we know was most likely Legionnaires and he could have died. While the lead levels continued to rise, so did the problems. My, my oldest would forget the stuff he studied the night before, so he'd go to take a quiz and completely blank on it. So we had to switch it to where we woke him up early to practice what he was taking a test over that day so it would be fresh in his mind. It was summer, we all drank water. No idea. We honestly didn't even feel it until we started to. And by that point, we, we I, I, uh, at that point I have no idea how bad it, it, it's going to get. As you can tell from my speech, my brain fog is still pretty hard. Had to relearn everything from scratch and going through high school and college, not fun. It wasn't just the kids that had health problems. Melissa's also took a fall. Mom's having troubles with her heart. She's having troubles with her lungs. She needs a heart monitor now. She has cancer now. It's not something I'm ever going to forget. With her family angry, sick, and scared, Melissa just couldn't sit there and let it be. She had to fight for what's right. And that same kind of health degrade, that's when her voice got louder and louder and louder. As a mother, I'm angry. As a mother, I'm afraid. But I'm also a fighter. Melissa took a big stand and made sure the world knew what was happening in Flint. Soon, her face would be seen everywhere, with her sons by her side. They should be playing, coloring, but they're coloring protest signs, and then they're going to, you know, to Washington, D.C., riding buses overnight to go sit front row for the congressional hearings so they could look at my kids' faces. You know, this is who you've harmed. The family took every step they could to help others not to drink the toxic water. We had water drives and such, and most of that was just because we all came together in fought, right? We made it public and made it known that we're not just going to sit here and get fed bad water. Melissa kept fighting and eventually testified before a congressional committee, despite the feeling amongst many that nothing could be done to create change. And then there was the whole thing of like, we can't fight back against the government. It's like, oh, well, now we are and we're winning and pushing. And then, yeah, the community came together. It was amazing. And we got a new mayor in. The press was all over the family story, too. But we did get to go to the Emmys. Um, you know, A&E and Sony and Lifetime came together with Katie Court to do a movie based on the first 18 months of our fight. Through the fight, there were some inspirational moments for the family. I met some great people going through this. Some people I aspired to be like. And I consider that a great victory in my part. Ten years later, Melissa is a well-known activist in not only Flint, but in the world. She still keeps the community updated on the crisis through her podcast, What Are You Fighting For? Is Flint's water safe? I'm going to let you tell me this. If you, had, if you had the best, highest quality water piped to you through this, would you drink it? Would you give it to your babies? The Mays family either. never fails to keep That's fighting for justice for the Flint community. It's, it's hard and it's a mix of every day. And, but that's why I get up and I still do this every day because I'm, I'm furious and I feel like I've got to fix something so nobody else has to be me. And Melissa's kids will be right behind her through this fight forever. We're going to keep fighting, right? It's not going to be something that ends because it's what needs to be done. The Flint people have been fighting for years for water. But there is another issue that has plagued this city. Poverty. Poverty is a cause and effect of this crisis. Rex Poff takes a look at its role through it all. There must not have been any value placed on the people who were being impacted. I don't think that what happened in the city of Flint would have happened in a community that didn't have a high concentration of poverty and that was not predominantly African American. Money. Many people in Flint don't have enough money. Flint was the poorest city in Michigan the year the crisis started, 40.1%. That's how many people fell below the poverty line. It was such a huge problem that the state attempted to mend the once prosperous city. Never to aid Flint, again. Governor Snyder assigned an emergency city. manager. Their job is to take over the city's governing body during a crisis in an attempt to fix the city's problems, taking power away from the elected officials chosen by the people. The emergency manager made the decision to switch the water source because it was a cost savings measure. Their role in the city of Flint was strictly to cut costs, to balance the budget, balance the books, correct the financial issues. 
On April 25th, 10 years ago, the state emergency manager switched the water to the Flint River in a desperate attempt to cut costs, which eventually led to the crisis we know today. Pastor Overton from Christ Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church in Flint has seen how the water crisis magnified poverty in the city. The, the number, just look at the residents in this community, the numbers are down. Um, there's more people walking the streets now. There, you know, you just see poverty everywhere. You see abandoned homes, abandoned buildings. Um, the infrastructure is just not what it used to be. And because of that, the residents have moved out of Flint. Flint has lost over 20,000 residents since the start of the crisis. While some left Flint, others couldn't. When the crisis struck, housing prices dropped roughly 27 to 38 percent. So many people couldn't sell their homes even if they wanted to leave. They were essentially stuck in a city that was broke with bad water. Poverty was not only the origin of the crisis, but it's also one of the main reasons it still isn't fixed. Our Flint families are struggling. It is very hard for them to make ends meet. When I am, when I am holding that Flint baby in my hand, it, 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 I struggle because there's something that I cannot prescribe to make them as healthy as possible. I cannot prescribe an antidote to poverty. Our, our Flint is the poorest city in our state. It's one of the poorest cities in the country. When kids are born into and grow up in poverty, it impacts them forever. It's like, it's like a poison. It's like, it's like a virus that makes it really hard for them to grow up to be healthy and successful. It actually impacts their brain development, impacts you know, how much food they have and, and the stability of their housing and, and, you know, and their family structure. Poverty is the root cause of so much of what ails us. Like a virus, poverty has infected many people in Flint, both physically and mentally, and they are losing hope in their city. People lose hope when you don't have the basic necessities of life. This community has lost a great deal of hope. If we can get economics rolling in this community and jobs where people can go to work and feel good about their jobs, feel good about going to work anymore and making an honest 40 hour um, a week living, people will start feeling better about themselves. It's sad, but we have to continue to have hope. Hope can transform into something special. The Flint water crisis will forever be a part of what the city is today. Through every single rocky moment, the Flint people have persevered. What happened to Flint is happening to places all across the world. This is the story of the lasting changes of the city today. I think the lasting effects of the water crisis is the lack of trust that people have in government. And I don't know how or when that's going to change. No pipe, no pipe, no pipe, no pipe. Don Jones, a journalist at WJRT in Flint, reported and lived through the water crisis. Watching her community suffer felt surreal. When I look back on that period, it's almost like, did that happen? And I think back to all of the bottled water, uh, all of the fear that people had drinking the water, bathing in the water. And you never imagined that something like that could happen in the community where you live. So when you look back on it, it's almost like you can't believe that happened. But it did happen, and it drastically changed how people live. I remember reporting on stories where people were lined up and we're talking for blocks and blocks to get free bottled water and when you go back and you look at the optic of that it almost looked like something that you would see in a third world country but not here in the U.S. and especially not here in the city of Flint, where I live in the state of Michigan. Poisoning the water supply for 100,000 people was something no one was ready for. You know, I guess there is no, there was no playbook for being poisoned, so we're writing it as we go. 
After years of government denial, water bottles, faucet filters, pipe replacement, government programs, and most of all, activism, Flint is now an example for cities across the country on how to deal with lead, both good and bad. And when you look around the country, there are other cities like Flint. We don't know where the next city will be or what the next city will be, but there are other cities with aging infrastructure who may find themselves in this similar situation. Chicago, Cleveland, New York, and even Benton Harbor, which is only 170 miles away from Flint, are all experiencing Flint-like problems. And according to the National Resources Defense Council, tens of millions of Americans are at risk of drinking lead-contaminated tap water. And other places are now having the same problem. If it happens again, you know, in a city a thousand miles away from here, we hear about it we're going to be triggered as a community because we know what that's like. We know what it's like to rely on bottled water. We, you know, we know what it's like not to trust that we can safely shower or bathe or brush our teeth. To address the issue, President Biden signed the Biden-Harris Lead Pipe and Paint Action Plan in 2021. Through this act, President Biden promised to replace every lead pipe in America before 2031. Every person in this country deserves to be able to turn on a faucet and have clean drinking water. And through the infrastructure law, we're making historic investments to make sure that they can. But that's easier said than done. After $100 million and years of replacing pipes throughout Flint, the city still has 5% of lead service lines still in use. When replacing service lines, you're replacing the pipes that connect a city's water main in the street all the way up to the individual homes. From there on, any lead inside the home is the homeowner's responsibility. To replace every lead service line in the country, the government has only promised $15 billion, but other estimates say it could take anywhere from 30 to 60 billion. Despite the hardships and work that still needs to be done, the community continues to pull together. Programs have been developed to connect families to health services, access to healthy foods to lessen the effect of lead poisoning, and help continue lifting families out of the ongoing poverty cycle. Yeah, this bad thing happened in Flint, but so many community agencies, moms and dads and our kids have stepped up and say, said, we are not going to be defined by this crisis. We are going to be defined by what we do next. And in that sense, yes, what happened in Flint, the water crisis, is the story of like this crime that was committed um, against our most vulnerable folks, but it's also this amazing story of resistance. It is an amazing story of how a community can come together to ensure that not just our kids have the brightest future possible, but that we make an impact across the nation. To say that the city of Flint will never be the same is an understatement. There have been many ups and downs since the start of the crisis. And though nothing can make up for the lives permanently changed, so much can still be learned. The community has fought struggled and brought faith back into their city when no one else could. They have shown the government that the last thing they will do is back down. The Flint people have created, advocated, overcame, and most importantly, shown resilience.